Hello. It's nice to be up here instead of over there for a change. Um, I want to talk to you today about T-shaped skills. So that's skills outside of your own skill set. I want to convince you that they're a great idea if you build anything, if you make products, services, and that they're a good idea for your career. But I also want to be a bit more dramatic and convince you that they are a good way of saving lives. So my name's Louise Bloom, and I'm a UX consultant. So that's my core skill. The upright of my T is user experience, consultancy, research, design, all of that stuff. But I've been doing that, as Danny said in the introduction, since uh, about 2002. So naturally, because there weren't very many of us, I have some other skill sets up there as well. So I can do a little bit of all these things. So that's what my personal T-shape would look like. But there is another reason why I am uh, here talking to you today, because I've taken quite an extreme approach to developing the top layer of my T. Um, because my name's Louise Bloom, and I'm also a physiotherapist. So what happened is about five or six years ago, there were things that I really wanted to know about how the body responds to stress when we interact with things, about how we can possibly measure that without asking questions, um, and also looking forward into a world where digital experiences are more immersive, where we're using our limbs and other parts of our body more. I wanted to understand how all that works. And, and we didn't have that knowledge in our discipline. There were no experts that I could turn to. So I decided to take a long, hard turn left and retrain as a physiotherapist, because that's where the people who know these things are. So it was a great idea, and it worked really well. And I came back uh, towards our industry with a lot of new information. Um, but as I graduated, uh, there was a pandemic. So I graduated uh, two years ago, and everybody with a healthcare degree or a qualification was asked to join the NHS and support the COVID efforts. So actually, for the last two years, I haven't been working as a user experience consultant. I've been working as a physio. And what I learned there and what I saw there was the way in which the healthcare professions really utilize this idea of T-shaped skill sets, which they call multidisciplinary working, and how without that, patient outcomes really would be uh, quite significantly hampered. And when I wrote this, this speech, I wanted to talk about that. But actually, as I turned on the radio this morning, something else happened. Um, I don't know how many of you followed the news, but the Manchester bombings report has just been issued. And within that, one of the key findings was if the emergency services that responded had had the insight into each other's work, if they could talk to each other, if they knew how each other's equipment worked, and if they'd trained together, that lives really would have been saved. So, so actually, the news wrote my talk for me this morning. But that's quite a tragic incident, so let's talk about a happier tale. Meet Edna. Um, one of my roles when I was working as a physiotherapist was to join my local A&E department in Eastbourne and work within their discharge team. So what happens when you go into A&E is you're not actually in the hospital. You're, not, um, you, you're physically in the hospital, but you're not a patient of the hospital until you're admitted onto a ward. And the best thing for everybody is that that doesn't happen. So the discharge planning team are there to help people leave A&E in a safe way, make sure that they're successful and they don't have to come back again. So this is a true story about Edna. That's not her real name, obviously, um, and that's obviously not her real face. <laughs> um, but Edna's an elderly lady, and she lives alone, and uh, she was unfortunate, as many elderly ladies who live alone are, and she fell. And she ended up being on the floor for 16 hours. Eventually, a neighbour heard her and uh, called an ambulance, and then she was brought into us at A&E. And all the people in A&E did all the things that people in A&E do. Edna was scanned, she was treated. And eventually, the doctor, who's responsible for all of the patients in A&E, declared her MFFD. Does anyone here know what MFFD stands for? 
Neither did I. So MFFD is what a doctor will write on a patient's notes to say that she does not need to be admitted into the hospital. If you see that, it means medically fit for discharge. So step one in this process is learning a little bit about the, word, the words that we use. So medically fit for discharge, what does that actually mean? Does it mean that Edna can now just get up and walk home? Well, no. So that's where the discharge planning team come in. The discharge planning team is made up of multidisciplinary skill sets, much like many of our own product teams are. We've got physiotherapists, and they'll be looking at Edna's mobility. Can she sit? Can she stand? Does she need any help? How far can she walk? There's an occupational therapist or an OT, and it's that person's responsibility to look at Edna's home environment, to consider what her needs would be, and their expertise enables them to make sensible decisions about whether adaptations need to be made or, if, or issue any equipment. And then, of course, there's the nurses who are looking after her medical care needs. So I've joined this team, and it's our responsibility to come together and come up with a plan for Edna. So we all need to do our individual assessments and join up thinking so that Edna can go home safely. How do we do that? We could do it like this. So each individual practitioner could apply their skills and expertise and then hand the task over to the next practitioner. Because we're the ones who know, right? You want the physio to be looking at mobility. You want the doctor to make the decision. Um, well, no. Actually, this, this process could take days. By the time each one of us has been to see Edna, she could have been lying in that bed for literally three to four days because these staff aren't available 24-7. I don't know what you know about A&E in the NHS, but that would be a dream come true. So all the time that Edna is staying in that bed, no one else can get into it. And if this is accident and emergency, so if nobody else can get into the bed, then somebody might be waiting in an ambulance outside. And if that ambulance can't discharge that person into A&E, then somebody who's waiting for an ambulance might not get one. So if we take this approach, it could cost lives. And actually, it's a really bad idea for Edna because elderly people don't do well in hospital. So we won't do it that way. We could do it like this. So each of us with our individual skill sets could apply ourselves to the task all at once. We could all go together and make our assessments and come up with a plan. So that sounds better. No, not really. Actually, from Edna's perspective, bearing in mind she's an elderly lady who's been on the floor for 16 hours. She's then been put into an ambulance, rushed to A&E, and she spent days now being assessed, poached, prodded in a busy hospital environment. If all four of us come at once with all of our questions and all of our ideas, that's really overwhelming, and we won't get good outcomes. And again, there's just not enough staff to do it this way. There's so many people in A&E. They're there 24 seven, and they all need this process done. So realistically, it's just not possible. And even if it was, it would be very, very hard to coordinate this approach. So this way is bad for the team. So I want to tell you what we do do. I've worked in UX for a long time, and I've always had multiple skill sets, but this was a really extraordinary example of how this works in practice. As a physiotherapist, I joined this team, and I was given just enough skills in occupational therapy and just enough skills in nursing that I could complete those assessments myself, I could do the thinking alone, and I was backed up by a team of professionals if I needed support with anything. That means that one of us can go and see Edna. We bring our shared experience to the task. It's a patient-centered approach. Edna doesn't need to know which one of us has those skills. She just needs to be asked the questions. And we can get that job done in two hours if we take this approach. So, by working in a T-shaped way, by adopting a level of skill in 
the professions around you, the people that you work alongside to get things done, you're more efficient. I think you're more effective, and it's a much smarter way of working, and Edna gets to go home. Um, before we move on, I want to just talk a little bit about the process of help, because it's a lovely idea, right? Great, we'll all get T-shaped skills, but actually acquiring those skills is a challenge. There's a practicality to the task. So I just want to talk to you about the way that it's done in the teams that I worked with in the NHS. So there's formal training, and we all have formal training. You know, you go on courses, you take degrees to other subjects about random things. Um, Within the NHS, if I want to undertake formal training, I can do that in any of the disciplines that I choose. I'm encouraged to do so. So I could have taken a pharmacology course. And that's one way that we're encouraged to adopt lateral skills. You can direct your own learning. There's a library at the hospital. I also have access to clinical research from all of the other disciplines. So I can choose to upskill myself and cross-skill myself. One of the best ways is to talk to my colleagues. So I'm working alongside people who are experts in their skills. And I'm really encouraged and proactively going and asking for help and admitting when I don't know things. And my favorite way is that there is a deeply embedded culture of knowledge sharing. So in the NHS teams, it doesn't matter if you are a student or if you're a senior manager. You get together in regular training sessions, which are called in-service training, and everyone teaches each other, and everyone listens to each other. So you might give a presentation for half an hour on a topic that you, you maybe knew nothing about, but you chose to research. Or you might share an experience from a recent activity, lessons learned, that kind of thing. But the culture is such that everybody listens to each other in a non-judgmental space, and we add to the vocabulary that way. So that's how it's done in the NHS. And I really thought it was worth bringing that example back because it struck me as a really clear way of describing the benefits of working in this way. T-shaped skills, then, will consist of a deep core skill. So whatever your, your job title is, that's, your, that's the, the upright of your T. And in addition to that, you're going to have some insight some expertise and capabilities in some of the adjacent professions around the task. So when you go home tonight, just have a little think about your own knowledge or even your own activities. Do you ever bleed outside of UX? Do you do some of the other things? Maybe you do have some project management skills in there. Maybe like me, you know some awful CSS and HTML. So that's why it's good for the outcomes. Um, but I really want to convince you that it's a good idea for you because you don't work in the NHS. It's not your job to save Edna's life. And I just believe that actually if you're working as an individual with lateral skills, with extensive, uh, with skills that extend outside of your zone, if you like, your lane, um, that you're more able to communicate and you can empathize with each other. I think you can reflect and learn in a way that you wouldn't be able to do if you couldn't speak in that way. And, and this is really, you know, this is a hot topic, but it helps you to avoid feeling isolated. Because essentially, I think life is just better when you're understood and you're able to understand those around you. But that's a bit fluffy, right? <laughs> so I'm gonna break it down for you in a much more cynical way. Why should you spend your time, your cognitive efforts and your resources Developing skills in what is essentially somebody else's job. Because we're not saying that you're going to, I'm not going to be an OT, I'm not going to be a nurse, so why should I learn? Okay, maybe you're at the start of your career. Maybe you are fresh out of a UX course and you're competing against each other for, for the best roles. If you can add a low level of skills to your CV, to your, to your vocabulary of the work that goes on alongside you, you user experience. I've said that so many times in my life. Um, you're going to stand out from the pack. An employer is going to see that you not only understand the context of the work that you do, but that you'll be able to fit in and collaborate and communicate with your colleagues. 
Maybe you already have a job, though. Maybe getting a job's not your, your thing right now. Well, even if you're in a role, I really think that it makes you a better employee. I think it makes you a better freelancer. I think that you will enjoy your job more and that your outcomes will be better. You'll design better things. If you're more established in your career, maybe your job title says senior at this point, learning outside of your lane is a really good way to stay interested. It's helped me stay focused because I don't know about you, but there's only so many prototyping tools I really need to learn. Um, so, so broadening my areas of expertise has really helped me to, to enjoy this profession and feel like um, it, it's something that I want to remain in and that I've got something to offer. And actually, maybe if you look left or right a little, you might find that there is another path, you know, that it's time for you to switch and there's something else you'd enjoy doing. And then there's those who are masters. Well, you're so skilled and so experienced at user experience, design, consulting, whatever, research, that they ask you to stand on a stage and tell other people about it. Why would you give up all of that collateral, all of that success, all of that skill, and go and stand in a uniform as a novice in a field that has nothing to do with your daily job and you know nothing about. Well, aside from being humbling, which is always a really good thing, I think that it's a great way to develop our profession. So like I said, I couldn't find this information within our discipline. There were no blogs, there were no training courses. And I'm not the only person who's done this. There are many people in our industry who, once they've reached a sort of level, have decided to widen the field. Because we're going to need to know new things as user experience professionals to deliver good products and services and to keep uh, users well represented as technology develops. So even if you're very, very senior, rather than deepening your core skills, perhaps it's a good idea to look outside of your own lane. The ways in which we do this are exactly the same. We've all got a formal training budget, whether it's self-appointed or your organization gives it to you. Maybe don't look at the UX courses next time. Maybe have a look at something else. You can choose how to spend your own time thinking about things. We've got, we've, there's plenty of places where you can research roles around your own um, without cost. Read books. If you looked at my bookshelf, only half of it relates to user experience. And then there's the favorite one, which is interpersonal training, which means talk to each other. You work alongside people who are experts in their field, so just ask them. You come up against issues on a daily basis in your work that, if you're honest, you don't really understand and aren't in your core skill set. So find someone who knows how to do it and just ask them. I've never met anyone who isn't delighted to be asked to share the knowledge that they have. And if you are in a position where you have the luxury of designing a team, of setting the tone, if you're a position of leadership, then please consider taking the opportunity to cultivate this, this knowledge sharing culture. I'm, uh, I'm very fortunate that I have um, come out of this and joined an organization where we do exactly that. Where every, well, not every week, but frequently, we will get together as a team and whether you're an apprentice or you're the CEO, we sit down and we listen to each other, we share something we're either excited about or passionate about or that just happened, and it's a safe space. It doesn't need to be the most expert person who speaks about it. And it really helps to get out of your bubble. UX shouldn't be a bubble. It's our job to represent other people to demonstrate things through someone else's lens and reminding yourself by just stepping outside of your own field is a great way to do that. So that's about us. <laughs> this is why selfish reasons and you know, moralistic reasons why it's good. But maybe you're listening to this and saying, well, it's not for my team. 
because actually that's a lot of resource you're talking about. On a practical level, what I've just described is allowing your employees, your staff, your team to take time out of their core role and go and learn something that you don't ever want them to really do. So why is that a good idea? This is why it's a good idea. Because we saw what happened to Edna when we took this approach. And your products or your services or your outputs, whatever it is that your team is doing, are Edna. And this, for those of us over the age of 25, is waterfall. <laughs> and we threw it out a long time ago because it's terrible. If you insist, and at this point I'm going to say insist, on only allowing your, your team members, your staff, your employees, whatever, or yourself, to think about this one thing called UX, then everything you're involved in has to be done this way. It has to be passed from hand to hand to hand to hand to hand. We get to the bottom, and what do we get? Nothing. It's terrible. And you have to go all the way back to the start and reiterate. So not taking this approach leads to waterfall, even if you call it agile. If you take this approach, your team looks more like this. You've got people who can talk things through. They can discuss things with each other. They can design with insights, not looking ahead and looking behind and knowing how it's all going to fit together in the end. You can actually boost your resource. So this isn't the point. But just like the example of the discharge planning team, I could do a little bit of the work of those people around me. I could do a little bit of the OT assessment, just enough. I'm not going to do anything complicated. I'm not going to do anything highly skilled. But imagine you get a glut of work, and all of a sudden, it's all hands on, on deck for dev. And you've got two or three people in the team who know a little bit. Maybe they can bug fix. You're actually boosting your resource by allowing people to develop in this way. So thank you. That's me. I'm under time, which is very exciting. Um, <laughs> because those of you who know me well, and some of you do know that you can't shut me up. Um, I really appreciate being asked to come up here and talk about this today. It's something I am actually very passionate about. I think it's, um, as Danny was saying at the beginning, I think it's something that's at the core of what we do, is to, to be the people who think outside of our own box. And hopefully the examples that I've given you today, although somewhat dramatic, have convinced you that you might run, you know, we have this phrase, jack of all trades, master of none. And you might become jack of all trades, and that's no bad thing. Developing a T-shaped skill set, you won't lose the ability to be master of some. Thank you very much.